What's up, Prime Time? We're back on the iPhone because we care about quality of content on this channel, not quality of camera. We're gonna be discussing bulking today. The number one mistake I see so many trainees make, including high level power lifters. So we're gonna discuss that. Now, as always, this video is gonna be split into two parts. If you wanna to get to the fun training, go ahead and fast forward. Beginning of the video is gonna be knowledge and theory. Later is gonna be fun squats and deadlifts. We won't call bench fun because currently my bench press is injured, so it's not that fun. But squats and deads are gonna be major cool. Um, bulking done the right way, guys. So let's just dive into it. What's the number one mistake I see people make? Only focusing on long-term linear scale increases as the main metric of the success of their bulk. So what do I mean by this? Usually people, when they cut, they get very aggressive or constrained to tracking their macros, tracking their body weight daily, and being on top of all the variables, as they should be. Because when you cut, you wanna make sure you're doing it at the appropriate pace, not too fast, not too slow. You wanna usually hold your mindset accountable, so you're usually aware of at least calories or macronutrient intakes of some kind, or you're eliminating certain foods or whatever it may be. And you kind of set up these parameters and boundaries to ensure you have success. And you look at a lot of details to ensure the success of this diet. And this is a great way to cut. And I think a lot of people actually usually successfully cut decently well. Uh, the problem is then they transition out of this and they start to do their bulk a lot more intuitively. They have less boundaries as they probably should. Like we don't wanna you know, be counting macros to the T year round unless you're that kind of a meticulous person. But most people will probably actually you know, develop some kind of like issue with eating disorders or something if they're trying to do that. I know I would. Um, but the problem is if we get too loose and we only use the metric of scale weight increasing over time, this doesn't paint a very good picture if we're maximizing our bulk. Let me explain why. Let's take someone who under eats for two to three days out of their week because they're really stressed and busy at work and they don't have time to eat and on those days they're kind of under eating. I'm sure a lot of you guys can picture this as yourself or other people you know who do this. And then they try to make up for those days, making sure they're eating really good and probably overeating a little bit on four days of the training week. Now, over the course of time, this exact person could probably create long-term linear scale increases from month to month, and they may look at their bulk as being rather successful. But me saying that out loud, you're already realizing the problem here is if you're limiting yourself on recovery for three days of the week and then overcompensating on the four days a week later in your, your work week, now all that's happened is you've gained extra fat on those four days for really no reason. Or maybe you just actually eat at caloric maintenance or, or a slight surplus on those days. You don't actually gain any extra fat, but either way you're left with three days where you have now under eight. And the problem here is now you're gonna have fluctuations in your recovery, you're gonna have fluctuations in your training, and add it up over the course of time, this can make a huge impact. Now, if you have one off week in your training, totally fine. Maybe you just got really busy and went on a vacation or something, weren't eating right or whatever. But if this is happening on a recurring basis, and I can't tell you how many people this actually happens to that I work with one-on-one, -on -one, because I'll be tracking their diets, and all of a sudden they'll have these downturns. They, oh, I had to move this weekend. Oh, this weekend got, or this week got busy at work. Or, oh, me and the girlfriend did this this weekend. And there's always these excuses. And what I've noticed after tracking so many athletes' diets over the course of, of years, really, these happen on such a consistent basis with nearly every client I work with, minus my more like professional power lifters, the guys who do this on a uh, kind of for, for a living or usually coaches themselves and whatnot. Most of these people have so many external factors going on in their life, they really don't maximize their bulks. Now, what are the problems here? So I wrote down some couple of notes here so I don't forget. But first off, your cutting success is gonna be um, manifested through your bulking success. So one, if you have a bulk that gets out of hand and you have really lacking uh, boundaries, and let's, let's say you're doing this. Let's say a lot of the time you're too busy and kind of under eating, and then other days you're overcompensating and eating too much, you're gonna gain a lot of unnecessary fat this way. And on top of that, when you go to cut now, you're gonna have to cut more fat than, than is needed. And on top of that, your bulk would not have been as successful in this scenario because like almost 50% of your, your training days have been just you know slammed by, by under recovery. 
even if we take a less extreme example where maybe someone does this once or twice a week, or maybe even just a few times here and there through a training month, if you add this up over the course of a training year, this can be really costly. One thing I really try to do to maximize my cuts anytime I've done them is to have a nice, slow and steady bulk. The only time I haven't done this is really when I was dealing with some injuries where I purposely was gaining more body fat than what was needed um, and really just kind of eating out of the bit of them. I wouldn't even have called it a, a bulk. It was basically a dirty bulk. Uh, my form of a dirty bulk doesn't get quite as messy as other people's because I can handle a lot of caloric intake. But um, besides that time, I've always lean bulked and I've always meticulously bulked. So I'm not really discussing lean bulking here. Really what I'm trying to get at is a bulking method where you utilize your total nutrient intake as the main measure of your success on a daily basis. So are you prescribed to three to four meals a day minimum to ensure you're getting nice protein feedings to maximize muscle protein synthesis? Because as all of you or most of you, I would hope know by now, yeah, at least if you're watching this channel, I would assume you know this, you cannot store, there's no storage mechanism for protein. Therefore, you have to maximize muscle protein synthesis through multiple protein feedings. Fasting is not as optimal. We have literature that shows that. I don't know why people actually argue this. Some people claim the literature doesn't show that. They're wrong and they haven't seen the right literature. It does show that you need to maximize protein intake. You can't just fast and have one or two meals a day. It's not gonna be ideal for anabolism. It just isn't. Um, so the second thing there though, is also gonna be ensuring that no matter what, you're getting in a lot of, let's call it high signaling nutrient content. So anytime you eat food, you're always gonna be signaling some kind of process in your body, whether it be through the intake of vitamins and minerals, through the intake of protein or carbohydrate, which will act as substrate to store glycogen, pull on water and give your muscles fuel and, and help with the process of ATP and, and uh, creatine storage and all these like fancy things that happen within the muscle belly. But whenever you're eating something, you're, you're getting something out of it. Now, again, where I see people go really wrong here and a thing I wrote down that kind of ties into this is when they're doing this kind of on and off bulk, as I'll call it, they tend to slam a lot of empty calories to make up for their, their lack of bulking. Because bulking done the right way is hard. Like if you're eating nutrient-dense foods, it's hard to eat enough in a training day. Especially if you don't naturally have a big appetite and your leptin and ghrelin levels are just fluctuated in a way genetically where you just aren't that hungry all the time. This is going to be a problem. And so if you're just slamming donuts or fucking sugary sodas or whatever it is, yes, that is a good way in an emergency to ensure you're getting optimal caloric intake in certain situations. I do actually recommend this to some of my clients, but where it can go wrong is where if that becomes a larger bulk of your diet, no pun intended there, you're going to end up actually um, lacking the proper nutrient drive and intake and signaling therefore in your body to optimize your performance and metrics like that. And so really this, this is like an all around problem that starts to come about in some vicious ways. And I see a lot of people just not maximize their muscle growth in the off season this way. I see a lot of people having to cut more when they cut later on after their, their bulk, after their off season. And I see a lot of people just dealing with fluctuations in their everyday training performance because of exactly what I'm saying here. And I think it's really important to, to take this into account. I have been bulking now again for the last uh, almost month and a half. And it's been very strange for me. And it's I've actually forgotten what it's like to eat so much food, especially calorie dense foods, and to try to do this the right way. I find my bulk has to almost be as, if not more meticulous than my cutting was. In fact, I, I might actually argue I have to be a little bit more meticulous when I'm bulking. It's a little bit harder to cut from a mental standpoint, being hungry all the time, but from like a, an actual like boundary standpoint, I think I set more boundaries for myself when I bulk rather than when I cut. Uh, that's what I wanted to discuss today. I hope you guys enjoy the training. we got a heavy squat bench and deadlift workout with some accessories here. We're going to show you. I think I got RP8. It's actually tomorrow that I'm doing this workout, so I don't even know how it went. Hopefully, it went good. Hopefully, this stupid fucking thumb is holding on with hook grip. Catch you guys in the next part.
What's up, Prime fam? We're going to take you guys through my squat, bench, and deadlift SBD strength day. As always, walk you guys through everything. We're going to be discussing today a little bit more about bulking. I want to talk about my bulk and some things I'm encountering during this process. I want to discuss RP optimization and how to really rate your RPs optimally, especially when you're feeling a little different than what the camera or velocity of bar speed is kind of dictating. And I also want to discuss uh, some PRs that Izzy's fucking hit and she's killing it, guys. I want to talk about why it's important to get a coach early on in your training. Now, starting off with squats, as always on the SBD day, I actually do my days uh, in the order of SDB. So I always do squats, deadlifts, and then bench press. Uh, working on the squat bar, I hate this damn bar, but I got to acclimate to it. It's a lot harder for me to squat on this bar than it is on a stiff bar. And that actually brings me to the first thing I want to talk about is actually at first, when I left the gym on this day, I was a little bummed out both by the squat and the deadlift. The bench made me happy. But um, in hindsight, when I actually looked back at the trajectory of where I'm aiming to go by the time I arrive at this meet and really where I've been previously, this was a huge sign for a lot of progress I've made. Now, you'll see here as I'm warming up, bar speed looks crazy. 385 is floating up like an empty bar. Uh, and then four reds here. This is 495 with the squat bar math. Uh, this is also flying up. But by the time I got to my top set of 517 for four at RP7 is what uh, the start of this block called for, I was a little underwhelmed by quote unquote how heavy it felt. Now, when I finished the set, I wanted to rate it at about an RP8. When I looked at the footage, it literally looks like an RP6, especially given how I treated the very last rep, which I you'll see here on the top set after this last warm-up set, I moved really, really controlled. So this is the last warm-up here, and then you can uh, watch my top set next. And I also didn't approach it with that, that much hype. Usually I'm getting really locked in and zoned in before, but overall, given the fact this is 500 and actually I think it's 18 or 19 pounds, someone do the math for me. And then uh, given the fact I'm doing this for four reps at RP7, just a couple weeks after missing two really heavy deadlifts of 750 pounds, and it's on the squat bar, and I am still, I think, 15 or 14 weeks out now at this point, this is a really, really good sign for things to come. So uh, smoke this set. Now, again, it felt a little heavier than what the bar speed looks. So what do you do in that situation? I know a lot of you have asked this question actually in the comment section over the course of the years. A lot of people say, hey, sometimes my squats or deadlifts feel way harder than they look on camera. Normally, if you're a beginner, I say to trust the feeling of the set a lot more than how it looks on camera. But in my case, I know I tend to undershoot a little bit when it comes to squats and I doubt myself, especially under fatigue. And the tricky part is you can have a squat set where your back's a little smoked, but your legs are still good and you're actually still in relative decent position. And so it might feel a little bit harder than it actually is. And so in that case, I kind of meet in the middle. I felt like it was an eight. It looked like it was a five to six, if I'm honest. So I'm going to rate it at about RP seven. Uh, we'll come back to that thought here in a second. Now, Izzy here, 165 pounds on the bar and she smoked the set. Look at her depth. Her depth's amazing. By the way, beltless and sleeveless. She doesn't have any lifting gear yet. She finally purchased a kick-ass belt from Pioneer that'll be coming in probably about another six weeks. But this is 10 pounds under what her one rep max was literally just three training blocks ago. Imagine in three training blocks, being able to take 10 pounds under your old 1RM that was a grinder, by the way. It was a grinder 1RM that she barely got. And then taking that and, and doing 10 pounds less for five reps. I mean, it's crazy. It was also probably RP8 or so. Really clean set. So fucking huge new five rep max for her. That beat her old five rep max from even just um, two training blocks ago by I think uh, 15 pounds or 16 pounds or so. So really big set there. And then I moved on to my back down set. So back to RP optimization. I think you have to know and and trust your gut on who you are when you're selecting your RP. So on squat, I tend to be an undershooter. On deadlifts, I tend to be an overshooter. And knowing this and staying ego-free, and when I view the footage and kind of come to some conclusions, I can actually use what I know about my personality type and base it on that. And I've also had so many squat sets, guys, over the years where I'm doing a top set and I literally think I'm not going to finish the reps, but I got my buddies cheering me on and they're fucking yelling at me. And then I end up finishing the reps a little bit easier than I think. So I've, I've always had this problem of chronically undershooting the squat a little bit. And I think it, it holds me back because it's always been a little bit more of a kryptonite for me as far as my, my build goes. I'm six foot. 
but really lanky in the limbs. And it's always been a, a lift I deal with a lot of injuries on. In fact, actually on that first back down set there, I felt a little bit of pain in my knee, which is what I was discussing with Izzy after the set. That's what I was talking about. And so you'll see how controlled I moved on this last set to make sure I just didn't injure anything, to make sure I didn't get hurt. And when you have the psychology of being a little hesitant like this from time to time on squats, it's really easy over the course of years of dealing with things like that to be a little bit more hesitant and and not trust yourself. As we're with deadlifts, I've never really sustained a major injury. And because of that, I've just ripped my fucking deadlifts. And if anything, I tend to be a chronic overshooter. So oftentimes I know I have to do the opposite. And if something is like, quote unquote, feeling good to me, I have to realize I might be lying to myself a little bit and look a little bit more at the bar speed itself. So look at this control here on this last rep. Fucking dunked it. 451 one for sets of four there really easy so a top set of four and then two back down sets of four this is week number one in the block so hoping by the end of this block i'm doing a wave of fours here uh, we were originally going to drop down to threes, but because we're so far out from the meet, me and Dylan decided having a few extra reps in there over the course of this training cycle might be more productive for me because my squat responds really well to volume. Uh, Izzy here. So this was actually already above her old one rep max from about four training blocks or so before. And she's supposed to do a single at RP8. Uh, she did this and I looked at her and I was like, that was clearly not RP8. So we went up some more and guys, look, I was filming her before the set. She had no clue I was filming her. Look how fucking jacked she is, man. Her shoulders and back and glutes have just blown up from this training. I'm going to do a before and after video one of these days. But when I say she's added a lot of muscle in a short period of time, it's actually crazy. And what's funny, she's a chronic under eater. So she actually lost weight. So she got leaner, got bigger and got stronger at the same time. Now we've been yelling at her about her diet, not actually yelling at her, but you know, just getting on her about it. And she's been eating more. And I think this cycle is going to be the most productive because this will be the first time she's actually not losing weight through a training cycle, which is also crazy. Um, but yeah, you can see here, I think this is 238 pounds or seven pounds, something else along the lines i'll have it on written on the screen but she smokes this it was supposed to be rp8 i still feel like this might be a little undershot she can grind deadlifts pretty good um, but it, i would say it was close enough so we let her stop there and next week she has a single at nine i'm probably going to low-key let her send it a little bit more though because she has a big deload after next week to initiate the next part of the training phase and so i'll probably let her you know maybe load up 253 or something like that on the bar we'll see uh but anyway moved on to my deadlifts um so you'll notice here looking pretty shredded still i can't gain weight to save my life uh so we we're talking about boundaries and bulking earlier and one thing i've changed recently is i've just removed a lot of processed foods from my diet especially during the weekdays on the weekends i have a little fun and i let that shit come in but the reason i've done this is i honestly i just believe the science doesn't show it yet I'm, I'm convinced the human body does not like processed foods. I, I don't think calories in versus calories out, Seco. I don't think the IIFYM approach is as, um, we'll say, long-term issue-free as people believe it is. So I just personally opt to avoid processed foods, and I also just have more satiety that way, which is great for when I'm dieting. But I'll be honest, this bulk's been a little bit difficult because I'm eating a lot of like whole sprouted grain breads and just a lot of really like dense micronutrient dense foods. And the reality of the situation is, is your body's very smart. If you eat a lot of empty calories that are not dense with micronutrients, your body is going to crave extra food to ensure it's getting its its optimal dosages of micronutrients. When you are getting that in your, your diet, of course, your body's not going to be as hungry. I don't think this has very much to do with fiber intake as much as people believe it does. I think it's just a host of nutrients that your body is craving. And when those are actually uh, present in your diet, I think you your satiety is going to be much higher. Um, so having a little bit hard time, but I think I have some, some cheat ways of figuring this out without adding in a bunch of junk previously i would really thrive or maybe i shouldn't say thrive but i would include a lot of cereals and shit like that but i'm, I'm gonna kind of report back here what i want to touch on is hook grip so here's set number one i got really zoned in for the set to focus you'll notice i'm actually not hyping up like i always do was really frozen there for a second to think and i'm just trying to just nail this hook grip and i'm not gonna lie it felt like shit I don't know what it is about hook grip, but every which way I try it, it either comes undone or it rips my hands apart. 
And it's not even a pain issue. If it was just pain, I would totally deal with it. But when I say it rips my hands apart, I mean, I'm getting gashes and scars all over my fucking thumbs already. And it's just been a problem. So I was, I was really pissed because this way I was pulling today was kind of in between that death grip I was doing originally on hook grip and then the low hanging fingertip. And it still almost gave out at the top there. So uh, being stubborn um, and also just trying to analyze, I decided to retake my top set of 683 pounds and do it mixed grip. Now, there's two things I notice. Hook grip feels stronger for sure in the body when the grip is locked in. Mixed grip feels a little bit harder in the body, but currently it definitely feels more secure on my grip. I think the other day when I missed that mixed grip, it was more because I was playing around with a fingertip mixed grip. So you'll see here on this 683, mixed grip, pulled up, Flies up pretty easy too. Probably about RP7 doing this two sets in a row. The first one was probably a six. And I held this fucker all day. Now, admittedly, it still did not feel that that secure in my hands. Like, I feel like on this day, I still couldn't hold on to 750 if I tried to go for it. And even if I had the strength for it, I think the grip would give out. So I'm really in this difficult crossroad where hook grip doesn't feel consistent or secure at all unless I death grip it. The last time I tried that 750 where I held it at the knees for hella long and it felt secure, I was death gripping it. And I can do maybe one to two top singles like that without my thumbs ripping. And even then it's kind of questionable. But the second I do any back down sets or any other extra reps, it's like my hands are just liable to rip. Um, I'm going to get with some guys this next coming weekend. I'm flying out to Virginia. So hopefully uh, Coach Dylan and my buddy Leon. And I'm hoping to maybe connect with Dan Griggs. We'll see if uh, Dan Griggsley, who's a fucking the, literally one of the strongest deadlifters in the world right now. He holds the record. And he's a crazy sumo puller. I'm going to see if he can maybe help me out with some things. I got his contact info today. I've been talking to everyone about it. And the one thing I'm noticing is everyone does hook grip a little differently. And so it seems to be a really big learning curve curve to understand how it's best suited for you. Uh, anyway, did my back down sets here. The first set is 617 for four flu. The second set, again, I tried a fingertip grip. So right there, that's more in the fingertips and it feels like shit. I don't, I don't know how guys do a fingertip grip on a deadlift bar. On a stiff bar, you can do that all day, but on a deadlift bar, it feels so insecure. So I actually opt for a deeper palm set and I have way stronger grip strength like that. I think also because my hands aren't too fat, it doesn't cause a lot of distance between the grip and the bar. Um, as where other guys with fatter hands, they're going to do a little bit better in the fingertips. But for whatever reason, my grip seems to irradiate more tension and power when it's a little deeper in the palm. And this is not just subjective to me. I've had a lot of clients who do way better with a deep palm set grip, especially on a deadlift bar. On a stiff bar, fingertip seems to always be the way to go. Maybe not fingertips, but really at the, the crux, the start of the fingers where the fingers meet the palm. It's kind of ideally where you want to wedge that bar in a stiff bar. Anyway, bench press, I was able to do comp grip today, guys. I was really excited about this. And I just did it really flat back. I don't know why, but something told me warming up that if I just went really, really flat on my back and didn't try to arch or retract my shoulders very hard or anything, that this would feel good. And it did. Um, I am depressing the scapula just a little bit and I'm using zero leg drive. It might look like my legs are pressing a little, but I'm literally doing none. And I was able to do these sets of eight at 243. And I did the first one with wrist wraps, the second one without wrist wraps, just to see if there's a difference in shoulder pain, because that was something I've been playing with lately is just training my bench without wrist wraps. And it seemed to feel a little bit better with wrist wraps, but hardly noticeable. So, um, but I can say bench press in general with wrist wraps feels stronger, which is really interesting. It shows you how, uh, how far your forearms go and wrist irradiation go when it comes to benching. Um, that actually makes me think, you know, maybe I should try John Hack's little trick. John Hack, when he pulls mixed grip, he uses wrist straps to clench his hands closed. I've always thought that was a bad idea, but admittedly, I've never tried it for an extended period of time. So maybe it actually would work to me. That would occlude the, the hand and wrist and, and maybe make your grip worse. Even though your hand is clenched closed, I couldn't see how you could grip tight like that, but perhaps it's possible. And maybe that's something I need to look into. I think long-term my, my end goal is to transition to hook grip. I just don't know if I can do it in time for this meet here in 15 weeks because Oh God, it, it just feels different every week. It never seems to feel right. And I'm trying to really figure it out. Uh, another uh, match PR here on these GHR sit-ups. Every week they get easier, guys. So last week I did the 70-pound dumbbell. This week I did 70 pounds again. 
And it just keeps feeling easier every week. I'm getting really strong at these. My core is going to be fucking godlike by the time I'm done with this training cycle. And to be honest, I don't think I'm ever going to pull this exercise out. Like, I really love this exercise. And it's the only major loaded hip flexion training I'm getting. So when I say hip flexion, I don't mean entering a state of hip flexion. I mean actually flexing your hips. So the complete opposite motion of a squat. A squat extends your hips, just like the deadlift. So you're producing force through hip extension. This is producing force through hip flexion. So this is really good at training that high rectus femoris crossover, which is a hip flexor, as well as the psoas and deep core muscles. And of course, you just get awesome abdominal contractions here as well. It's just an all around amazing exercise. But what I love about this is I think it's really making my my hips and my core a lot more stable in my squat. And I've noticed I haven't had any adductor issues since doing this, as well as a lot more stable feeling squats. And I think this is playing a really large role in there. Previously, I was really obsessed with Copenhagen planks. Um, but for whatever reason, I just haven't been really on a groove of doing those. And I've been doing these and my adductors actually seem better than ever. And the way I'm able to kind of sit into my hips in the squat now feels really good. Like it feels like I can get nice and deep without forcing it. Uh, but knowing my luck, I'll post this on YouTube and then a week later I'll fucking tear my adductor again. So <laughs> let's not jinx myself too much. But yeah, uh, anyway, finishing up these sit-ups here, me and Izzy kind of go back and forth to keep each other accountable on, on rest times, probably about a minute and a half between each set. And you can see I'm keeping this well over my chest. I actually critiqued her on this later in the video. I was telling her to keep it a little bit higher on the chest uh, or up towards the chin and neck even because that creates a longer moment arm and obviously it's going to make it a little bit harder due to leverage on the abs compared to if you uh, hold the, the dumbbell down by your pecs or you know upper ab area. Um, so you can kind of alter leverage here too on these, by the way, if you're a beginner at them. Uh, but anyway, that's pretty much the video. I'll let the, the footage play out from here. If you guys are interested in group coaching programs, head over to prime-strength.com. We just started season eight of our group coaching. Guys, it's a fucking kick-ass program this season. You guys can go ask my buddy, Amel. He's one of our, our members over there. He's doing a meet actually with the program. I've been talking to him. He's loving the program. Everyone's messaging us saying this is one of the better programs of the group coaching. This one came out fucking sick. I love the layout of the program. So uh, if you guys are interested, both the SBD and Fusion. Uh, I am discontinuing the Prime program. It's something I announced to our group coaching members. You might still see it on the website. Season 7 is available, but it's something I won't be actually continuing moving forward because honestly, it just didn't have a lot of interest, sadly. Fusion uh, is by far our most popular program. We have so many fucking power builders. It's insane. It's actually like twice as many as any other program we've ever offered, and it always stays uh, the most consistent. So I know you guys love your power building, and this season's uh, power building program program fusion is fucking insane the program is really really fun i'm running the spd version of it so i'm on a powerlifting specific program right now uh just because i am in a meat prep and me and dylan kind of alter it to fit me but i'm using the template of what i des design for the group coaching for myself as well it's just i altered the details to fit what i need a little bit more than what the uh coaching members are doing in a more broad sense but yeah uh that's pretty much the video guys i'll catch y'all in the next one